טוב, אז קודם כל צהריים טובים לכולכם, היי, למרות שהרב שם שרשום לי מתחת לפרצוף שלי זה יעל, יעל היא המנכ"לית ואני אפרת, אפרת דולב, אז כמו שאתם רואים, אני עושה תוך כדי, וואו, אני כזאת עם מולטי טסקינג, אז אני גם מצרפת אנשים תוך כדי לוובינר שלנו, ואני רוצה גם להגיד לכם תודה רבה שהגעתם ושלום לכולכם ככה בזמן ארוחת הצהריים. Uh, היום אנחנו תהיה לנו הרצאה על פוסט פנדמי גרין סיטי אז uh, הכי קרוב לטיסה שנקבל בזמן הקרוב אנחנו הולכים לבלות בשעה הקרובה בסינגפור uh, ואין ספק שמשבר הקורונה ככה משפיע על כולנו ומוציא uh, בין השאר את החולשות של הערים uh, המתוכננות uh, שלנו אז היום אנחנו שמחים לארח את uh, טיילי ציאן שהוא איתנו כאן כבר, הוא מסינגפור, רגע סליחה אני מצטערת שאני ככה קטועה תוך כדי, טיילס יאנג הוא ארכיטקט ומתכנן עירוני משנת 1990, הפרויקטים שלו זכו גם בפרסים מקומיים וגם בפרסים בינלאומיים, בשנת 2011 הוא נבחר להיות הפרזידנט של גרין בילדינג קאנסול of uh, Singapore. Uh, הרזומה שלו, וואו, רגע, שנייה, allow to, שנייה, אני נותנת לכולם להיכנס. אני לא מפספסת פה אף אחד, תוך כדי. ככה, הרזומה שלו הוא מאוד מאוד מרשים, למי שככה יצא לו להסתכל באתר, אז אני לא אספיק לספר לכם על כל מה שהוא הספיק לעשות, uh, אבל כן אני אציין שבשנת 2018 uh, הוא הצטרף לרשות שאחראית על הבנייה והשיפוצים בסינגפור והוא כיום מנהל בפועל מטעם ממשלת סינגפור ולפני שטיילי יתחיל אני רוצה רק לדבר כאן קצת על לוגיסטיקה כמו שאתם רואים אתם בעצם כולכם כאן איתנו uh, מאוד חשוב לי שתשמרו על מיוט uh, כדי לא להפריע בזמן ההרצאה הוובינר עצמו הוא כשעה um, טיילס יאנג ידבר משהו כ-40 דקות, בסופו אנחנו ניתן כ-15 עד 20 דקות לשאלות. לפי כמות המשתתפים אני כבר אומרת לכם, אנחנו לא נספיק לענות לכל השאלות. כן חשוב שאם תרצו, תרשמו את השאלות באנגלית, אני אעביר את כל השאלות אה, לטיילי והוא יענה עליהן במייל. אנחנו בסופו של הוובינר, הוובינר כולו מוקלט, אז אנחנו גם נענה גם יהיה את המענה לשאלות אה, במייל שנשלח וגם את ההחלטה. אה, וזהו, טיילי, I uh, will give you the honor to start the webinar. <laughs> uh, Thank you. We have like 50 people now and people are getting in every minute, so... <laughs> Okay, it's all right. Yeah. Shall I uh, upload the, my sh presentation? Uh, can you share the screen or can't you? Yes. Okay. Just a minute. I'll put myself in mute. Give me a minute. Uh, okay, uh, shall I start? Yeah, sure, you can start. Good luck. Thank you. So a warm greetings to all of you. Um, now I thank you for taking time off to come and listen to me. Um, it's something that uh, I feel it's important as we together as a Green Building Council family to always uh, share with each other what we can do to help uh, make our cities and our planet greener. So I've chosen the title post-pandemic green cities uh, as a title because I feel that green building movement should seize the, well, quote and unquote, unfortunate opportunity of COVID-19 to up our efforts towards greening of cities. For too long, we have been trying to green one building at a time with COVID-19 
we saw both threats and opportunities. So great that nations and cities harness enough courage to act for their own survival. So clearly we can green our cities if only we understand the potential benefits, global trends and strategies. Post pandemic green cities is a lecture that I prepared for this time, much more cities to ramp up their sustainability efforts. Cities are probably one of the greatest invention by mankind. Uh, people generally feel the need to live together and the only way they know how is to build their home side by side. From villages, they evolved into towns and cities. Cities became more structured over the centuries. With rising population, cities embody many other inventions such as high-rise construction, elevators, mass transit, and infrastructure. Despite the innovations, failures unfortunately stand side by side with successes. Many cities grew uncontrollably and evolved into unbearable density or monster slums. Up until 2019, my own personal view is that 90% of all Earth cities are not sustainable. In 2016, when I assumed the position of World Green Building Council Chair, I also uh, published a personal book entitled Cities of Love. My aim was to encourage cities to rethink sustainability through the lens of love. Because I think that if you love your city, uh, you will sustain your city. Clearly, people are not loving their cities enough. I also took the opportunity to identify ingredients that will make cities sustainable. And amongst these so-called ingredients, I advocated a family-oriented city where I see life evolves around homes and work could be organized from home. Sounds familiar? I had no idea that COVID-19 would force all of us to work from home today. I merely wanted family members to spend time growing up together instead of being divided by city life. So it's uncanny that uh, this idea actually uh, resonate with today's uh, solution. So the weaknesses of cities were badly exposed by COVID-19 pandemic. All the problems associated with cities up until end of 2019 actually aided the spread of the virus. COVID-19 virus, as uh, one of my doctor friends says, is a very sociable disease. The higher the density city of a city, the more sociable the community is, the faster the spread. When governments realized that the best cure was lockdown, <clears throat> people are forced to work from home. More problems emerged. It's simple to say work from home, but there are actually many issues that cannot be organized properly. Cities suddenly find that critical functions cannot be carried out because their whole supply chain and infrastructure were never planned with something like COVID in mind. Yet the greatest irony about COVID-19 was the rather positive environmental impact. Carbon dioxide level dropped to 2006 level and actually reduced by 1 billion ton. This took place sometime in April, 2020. During the same period, Global demand for electricity dropped by 20% and the world used 6% less energy. Most polluted cities suddenly enjoy clear blue sky. The canals of Venice suddenly became clear and transparent. Cities became eerily clean. Something right must have taken place. I think this is a time to reflect and to rethink. What we fail to do as a global community to fight climate change is now suddenly turned on our heads. We find a light at the end of the tunnel, not by choice, but rather forced by circumstances. 
So my proposition today for the post-pandemic green cities is that we seize the chance to rapidly transform. There are three parts to my presentation. Part one is about developing a self-sustainability roadmap for our city. I encourage cities to start developing uh, three areas of self-sustainability in energy, water, and food. These are fundamental building blocks of cities. Part two, to adopt new paradigms of live, work, and play to reduce waste and consumption in our city. Cities are occupied by people, but there are far too many old paradigms that are no longer suited when we push for green cities. We need to make a clear shift. Part three, establish new strategies for our city that will steer us into higher level of sustainability. Cities must embrace new sustainable values if they wish that their homes could last forever. These new values must be translated into new strategies. So let's start with part one, self-sustainability. Most people today want sustainability, but they do not want to limit their consumption. We want to be net zero energy status, but we want someone else to produce the solar power and sell to us. I suggest that we learn from nature. A tree, for example, survives based on its own roots to draw water and ingredients from the ground. A tree bears its own weight of the branches and leaves and effect photosynthesis to produce food. Sometimes, they even carry the weight of animals that dwell on them. This to me is the best illustration of the concept of self-sustainability. So I put this together that self-sustainability can be defined as the ability to consume within its own means of production without jeopardizing the survival of others. But I accept that many cities today are unable to be self-sustaining because it was never planned that way. But if we keep propagating the idea that cities do not need to be self-sustaining, then I think we're going to be draining the resources of the earth. And I think it's time that we start to think about these ideas and see how we can migrate towards a self-sustaining model. And we need to begin to reverse the trend. I'm not sure how many of you have uh, been to Singapore. I thought I should give you a sense of Singapore's uh, geographical characteristics before I share with you some of the good case studies uh, within my country. Singapore is tiny, very tiny. It's a tiny city state of only 728 square kilometers. I think Israel is about 30 times our size. But if I'm not wrong, your population is only 1.6 times there about of ours. Ours is at 5.6 million. The smallness of our nation will immediately raise a alarm bell from sustainability point of view. I'm sure you have the fair share of experience and you will resonate with us when I mention some of these burning questions. One is, how do you sustain the city in terms of critical resources such as energy, water, and food? Second point, second question, how do you house so many people happily on such a small footprint? It's one thing to house the number of people, it's another thing to make sure they're happy. Well, these are the, some of the interesting case studies and solutions that I intend to share with you. Now, there are three essential elements for the survival and sustainability of the city. I don't need to elaborate why these are important. I'll give you the background of Singapore's own challenges. Firstly, energy. Singapore does not produce oil, even though we have one of the largest oil refinery plants in the world. We have very low wind speed, that makes alternative uh, wind turbine energy 
uh, almost impossible. Nuclear is clearly not an option. Uh, it will wipe us out if anything goes wrong. So the only viable solution is solar. Currently, 95% of our energy is from natural gas imported from nearby regions. Water. Currently, Singapore imports 250 million gallons of water per day from neighboring country, Malaysia. This takes care of about 60% of our needs, but the agreement will expire in 2061. If your country's water supply depends heavily on your neighboring country, this is not sustainable. Singapore needs a better solution. Food. Today, Singapore imports about 90% of our food supply. Of all three elements, food supply is taken for granted during peacetime. COVID-19 pandemic shows up some of the vulnerabilities. In the past, Singapore has experienced disruptions due to outbreak of food diseases and political change in source countries. This affects pricing and adequacy of supply to Singapore. So let me start with uh, some uh, deeper dive into our energy sustainability. Singapore's drive for energy sustainability really started in 1970s during the oil crisis when prices of oil soared between 100% to 400%. As a young developing nation, it was clear that economic growth cannot be sustained if we do not have clear strategy on energy efficiency. In Asia, Singapore was the first country to develop an overall thermal transfer value or OTTV regulation in 1979, basing on ASHRAE standards, but with refinements to suit local climate and construction practices. And those of you remember from 2003 to 2005, the barrel of crude oil price went from US $25 per barrel to almost US dollars 150 per barrel. So the whole world suddenly again woke up to the fact that energy supply cannot be taken for granted. Now at around the same time, uh, that's where the world also woke up to the fact that the earth was indeed very ill. Those of you who have watched uh, Al Gore's uh, in, An Inconvenient Truth released in 2006 will agree with me that it, I think it's probably the, the very show or movie that communicated to a whole generation of the severe effects of climate change. In 2005, Singapore transited from an energy only regulation towards a more holistic green building certification tool known as Green Mark. As in, like you have LEED, you have PREAM, so we have our version called GreenMark. And GreenMark is actually started by the government. By 2008, GreenMark was made mandatory by act of the government. And I hear that uh, Israel has also gone into that area, mandating the requirement of green certification for a building. I think that's the best move. The goal for us is to- I saw this on the web. The goal for us is to achieve basic green mark standard for 80% of all building floor areas by 2030. Today, the count stands at around 40%. So as I said earlier, my view of our green certification is that it should be made mandatory and not left to market forces. It is too critical to leave it to individual and collectively a country must pick up its mind. Now, if you are familiar with World Green Building Council, this uh, famous graphic called Advancing Net Zero was produced in 2017. Uh, I was the chair from 2016 to 2018. And I remember that uh, when we uh, celebrated COP21 in those years, we also realized that we face a grim reality that we may not even get there to lowering the global warming temperature by 1.5 degrees Celsius. We're talking about two degrees at time. And we concluded that nothing short of a net zero approach 
would be sufficient. So advancing net zero, a global project aimed to accelerate uptake of net zero carbon buildings to 100% by 2050. This project works with Global Green Building Council Network to develop tools and resources, including net zero carbon building certification schemes and training programs to support their advocacy work with their members and local governments and build industry capacity. Its determination of a net zero carbon building is one that is, or rather definition of a net zero carbon building is one that is highly energy efficient with all remaining energy from on-site and or off-site renewable sources. Now, this is easier said than done because we have a world of uh, green buildings collection, which are just barely basic. And we want to push for net zero. We need to have a roadmap. We need to have a intermediate step, just like a baby. You can't expect a baby to start running the moment it is born. So to navigate towards net zero for us in Singapore, uh, under the Building and Construction Authority, we revamped the Green Mark certification to further develop a new category known as super low energy buildings. This category of building aims to achieve 80% improvement on energy efficiency compared with the 2005 baseline standard. We see this as a necessary next step to finally achieve net zero status in the future. In the tropics, I'm not sure how many of you are aware, you have four seasons, but for us it's the tropical belt. It is not so easy to achieve net zero carbon buildings if you have to have air conditioning to a building. Just to sidetrack a little bit, uh, our previous Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew, a founding Prime Minister, considered air conditioning as the greatest invention of mankind because he felt that a country like Singapore needs an air conditioning so that people can work harder. In the hot tropical climate, if we were to stay in a room that is not well ventilated, we fall asleep easily. So if a whole nation's success is really founded on air conditioning, you can imagine how difficult it is to go to be a net, go to achieve net zero carbon building. Our temperature, Typically for 12 months in the year, out of that about nine months, it is like summer. The heat can get as high as 35 degrees Celsius. There are two short wet seasons with temperatures still hovering around 25, 26 degrees Celsius. And because of the tropical belt, we have overcast sky with lots of clouds that make solar energy uh, harvesting very challenging. But our Industry players make an attempt. So in this picture here shows um, the first net zero carbon building made with steel and mass engineered timber. And it is completely powered by on-site solar energy with help in removing some of the spaces uh, from air conditioning to passive cooling. Now, we, in order to march towards net zero energy, we need more research and innovation, especially in the area of building science. This is where I welcome some of you with great ideas about how to create net zero building uh, to come visit us, share with us your technology or your solutions. Next, I'll speak about our water sustainability. To ensure that we can be self-sufficient in our water strategies, we embark on an ambitious journey to store, recycle, and produce fresh water relentlessly. To store water adequately, two-thirds of Singapore land area is designated as water catchment. Singapore practically collects every single drop of rainwater and drain them towards our 17 reservoirs. Many of the reservoirs were created through water wheel or dam technology to convert seawater into fresh water passively. Another strategy is a deep tunnel sewerage system or in short called DTSS. It is a cost-effective and sustainable solution to meet Singapore's long-term needs for used water collection, treatment, reclamation, and disposal. DTSS used 
uses deep tunnel sewers to convey used water by gravity to centralized water reclamation plants, WRPs, located at the coastal areas. The treated used water is further purified into ultra clean, high grade reclaimed water called new water for industrial use. So you can see we take every drop of water seriously. Of course, the last piece of uh, strategy is desalination. Not the best solution, but being surrounded by seawater, we could tap into it. It is energy intensive. It has to be supplemented with renewable power. This completes the jigsaw puzzle to bring us to a complete water cell sustainability. We think we can do it within the next few decades and that will help our survival tremendously. So next, I got to cover quickly of food sustainability. Singapore is relatively new in the area of food sustainability. COVID-19 pandemic accelerated our strong interest in urban farming. Today, Singapore imports about 90% of our food resources from 170 countries. We set a vision of 2030 to achieve at least 30%, 30% food production within Singapore. This requires the use of technology to overcome severe land constraints. So we have some of the uh, many good experiments on vertical farming right now going on in Singapore. Now, other than vertical farming of vegetables, this is a picture of a multi-story fish farm. Overall, local fish farms produce about 10% of our overall needs today. Given our determination to survive, I'm sure someday we'll be self-sufficient in food. Now that gives you uh, the end of part one, uh, a sense of Singapore's self-sustainability in three key areas, energy, water, and food. Of course, there are many micro areas that we can look at self-sustainability, uh, but I thought those are the big picture that gives you a sense of why it is so important for us to be a truly green city by being self-sustainable. Now I'm going to go on to part two that talks about new paradigm. If part one is about the hardware, the engineering solutions and the policy success of the country, part two deals with changing paradigms and how we cope with changing paradigms and how do we capitalize on it. Now, of course, I'm going to touch on digitalization, which has a large part to play and COVID-19 accelerates our acceptance of such changes. To avoid change for change's sake, the relevant question to ask is, what is the foundation that a city must build upon to avoid being tossed to and fro from one major disaster to another major disaster? So I could to touch on some current paradigm in particularly from planning point of view. This is a map of Singapore. Up until COVID-19, the life that we knew then was normal. Like many cities, Singapore embraced a set of planning norms to keep the three basic life activities separate, live, work, and play. Most cities develop central business district or regional hubs to house business activities centrally. These places of work includes finances, services sector, and trades. Industrial activities are typically deemed incompatible and tucked into remote and less valuable real estate. And then living quarters are organized in concentric manner around these places of work. As population grows, these concentric circles become bigger and bigger. And lastly, play is an activity that is often an afterthought they are dotted in between live and work. Now, what, what is this result? The result of this old paradigm is that people always have to commute between activities. Even in our small city state like Singapore with a relatively good uh, transportation system, the average travel time needed is about 30 to 45 minutes by car. Uh, that is traveling from, say, more or less from east to west, and double that amount of time by public transport. 
So if you can imagine cities that are less efficiently planned, this time can be double or triple. So assuming that you have to do this travel two or three times a day, your eight hour day could be reduced by 30% or more. What the loss of productivity yet we embrace as the only normal way to live. So COVID-19 changed the normal paradigm and helped us to see a different way to live. Our whole life is suddenly centered on the space called home. There are many who support working from home, citing reasons such as family bonding, safety and efficiency. There are those who actually cite the opposite. And regardless, working from home becomes a reality because of digitalization. To those who you, their homes become a true multi-purpose asset for live, work and play. For many who are desk bound, it is not surprising to find themselves adapting quickly. Many also found extra time, in fact, to live, work and play. I don't know about you, many of my colleagues, including myself, find that we actually do more meetings online compared with previously uh, working in office. The lessons of working from home points to one thing. We need a safe haven called home for the concept to work. For the homeless, this is not gonna be a viable option. I believe that the reason why Singapore coped well with COVID-19 is that housing plays a key role. Before COVID-19, nobody envisaged that we could all be locked up in a single space and perform everything in life. Singapore invested in affordable and quality housing for our citizens since the foundation of our nationhood. While every nation understands the importance of housing for social political reasons, nobody thought that the meaning of the word shelter means more than shielding from rain and sun. It is my personal opinion that every green city that aspires to be sustainable, they must first and foremost solve their housing issues. So I'm going to give you some history of our housing solution. In 1960, there were several key strategies to keep Singapore alive under the leadership of our first prime minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. First is the rapid building of industrial park for foreign investment. Second, to create a national service system where every 18 year old male is required by law to serve in the military for two and a half years in order to boost our self-defense. I understand we learned from you. Third, a housing plan to build new towns rapidly and provide all citizens with a home that they can own. The housing scheme was so successful that today, more than 80% of Singaporeans live in a public housing flat, known also as HDB flat, in short. The reasons for this success are manifold. Key to it is affordability. So I thought I'd take this chance to also share a bit with you the economic aspect. The price of a 100 square meter flat costs about 300,000 Singapore dollars today. Um, based on the government assisted loan scheme, the monthly repayment over 25 years is only about $1,200 per month. A young fresh graduate will probably earn about $3,000 per month. And this housing privilege also requires young Singaporeans to apply as married couples and therefore the loan Combined income will never exceed 30%. The housing solution not only solves housing problem, it simultaneously addresses the social issue of family building and social cohesion. So while that housing problem was solved, not with COVID in mind, but it actually becomes a foundation of how we cope with this pandemic. This is a picture of a flat not a private condo, but the HDB flat, public housing flat. <clears throat> now, the fact that 80% Singaporeans live in one means that they can be properly organized to cope with COVID-19. All homes in HDB are wired with at least 4G network. A typical HDB town or public housing town is structured to provide adequate food supply within close proximity. Thirdly, evacuation of sick patients can be done rapidly with good connectivity to healthcare facilities nearby. So the very thing that gave Singapore a lot of stability during COVID-19 are our homes. Its true value during COVID-19 is not fully appreciated sometimes, I feel. Stability and comfort during lockdown are absolutely essential. 
So I like to say that vaccine is not a cure, but affordable and organized homes are the long-term strategies. I just throw in this slide to suggest um, how we should look at homes of the future. Uh, and there are many studies now going on, but my, my concern is that once uh, vaccine is up, COVID-19 is forgotten, people will go back to business as usual. But I think we need to make our homes more resilient because we don't know when disease acts will strike. So just uh, some fun thoughts here for us to consider. The future of homes may require an entrance lobby that works like a cleansing chamber to again disconnect us from the world outside uh, physically. And dining becomes a big thing when we're locked down at homes. There are so many people who become expert chef suddenly in the last 12 months. So the dining experience need to be again charged up and our work is practically from home most of the times and you need more sophisticated infrastructure and companies having saved up on rental charges because of smaller office in the future should think about investing in their employees. And certainly delivery by drones, not an impossibility. So I'm gonna move on to part three. If part one covered the basic approach of self-sustainability and part two highlighted the changing paradigm and evergreen panacea to combat pandemic through quality and affordable homes, part three will highlight some key principles that I think future green cities should consider and embrace. And these three are integration, connectivity and diversity. I believe that by doing so, we will not just be sustainable, but also be successful socially, economically, and environmentally. First, integration. Integration is simply the act of combining many things to make them a whole. It sounds easy, but we have been taught to be segregated so much so that we even refuse integration in the very first instant. Why? Because we learn to suspect rather than trust. We learn to doubt rather than believe. We learn to fight rather than collaborate. To please the mindsets of people who are brought up to be segregated, planning of cities take on the silo approach and it is a case of divide and conquer. So the efficient city model can no longer take on a silo approach, but instead should adopt, my view, a mosaic approach to be more sustainable and efficient. We must be prepared for convergence rather than divergence. So I'm gonna just run through some examples, interesting examples in Singapore. Um, when we talk about uh, plastics, where we try to prevent overuse plastic, we promote multi-use rather than single use. Now, interestingly in buildings, uh, we're doing the reverse. Uh, we started in Singapore with this building in 1973, which is actually the first deemed to be the futuristic first mixed use development with a terrace of housing sit on top of uh, the white bands, which are the offices, and then at the bottom are the uh, shopping mall. Now, people actually didn't like to live in a mixed use environment because they deemed those users incompatible. And true enough, over the decades, it suffered uh, degradation. Uh, but by 2000s, um, there was a call for people to return to cities and occupy the cities. and we find that mixed use become a cool thing to have. And this suddenly become fashionable again. And we recently have our planning authority even uh, guess at this building for conservation. So mixed use was about adjacency or non-conflicting users. And at that time, uh, and we're gonna see more of such example integration. So in Singapore, we started to push the frontier of integration of complementary users, even though they are not usually co-located. This building that you see in the picture is called Kampong Emirati, which won the World Building of the Year Award at the recent World Architecture Festival. It brings together at least five complementary users under one roof. 
On the left is actually the studio living for the elderly. On the right, beneath the terracing greenery, a medical center, elderly care and childcare facilities. All these elements sit on top of a podium of food and beverage and commercial outlets. The roof also has a community garden and farm. So this is how Singapore began to move away from silo uses to create self-sustainability even at the building level. And it responded well to the paradigm shift. So some more examples here. This is actually a integrated community hub where for the first time, multiple agencies of government came together to develop a building that contains the library, the uh, agencies that deal with work uh, employment, deals with health, uh, deals with community building, social family services. And best part of it is this building contains a full football stadium all integrated into one. Now, something closer to what I do daily to deal with building and construction, we also start to see that even our building process need to be integrated. So we are actively moving away from on-site building to off-site manufacturing. So this, for example, is what we call a prefabricated uh, volumetric construction. So the whole unit of a room complete with interior finishes is actually done in the factory condition and hoist to the site. So to achieve this, we need new kind of facilities called integrated construction hub, where we house construction workers, uh, precast prefab machines, automated um, systems, offices, all within this compound, where they produce those boxes that you see in the previous slide. So this is another example of an integration. Moving forward, we also uh, rethink the paradigm of airport. This is Singapore Changi Airport. And in the middle, this uh, donut shaped building is called a uh, Jewel Changi. Of course, uh, Singapore pride itself to be an air hub. Of course, now at COVID-19, everything comes to a standstill, but I thought it's interesting to share this concept that the airport authority decided that the airport doesn't have to always just be a transport hub. It can be a living room for Singaporeans. So what they have done is that they turn the center of airport, which normally is full of car parks, into a green living room for the citizens of Singapore. So this is one of the biggest uh, green greenery, uh, green indoor conservatory complete with a shopping experience uh, for Singaporeans to enjoy. And it turned out to be so popular, not just with Singaporeans, but also with tourists. And it is an interchange of many transportation uh, mode. So I'm gonna move on to uh, an area other than uh, integration is connectivity. So I've shown you some examples of how we integrate functions within the building to make them more relevant and more sustainable. I want to touch on the second salient st strategy, which is connectivity. Now, I started off by putting down the word transport, but I changed it immediately to connectivity because there's two big difference there. Now for a transport expert, everything in life must move and move at the fastest speed if possible. I once attended a smart city conference and amongst the panelists or speakers from building industry, there was a telco executive. When asked what does smart city mean to him from a built environment point of view, he answered, the smartest city for me is one that I don't have to move at all to get things done. It was such a revelation for me. But of course we still have to move, uh, move smartly and not blindly. Instead of traveling long distance from home to work, now we need to move smartly within our estate, within our community. So in Singapore, we start to connect buildings a lot. And this is, in this picture, is actually a public housing within the cities, a 56 tower blocks of 50 story skyscrapers. In order to bring the community closer together, they are connected at two levels, three levels, ground, mid ground, and also high ground where the facilities are located. 
So as you can see, I'm starting to talk about connectivity, connectivity from a different uh, perspective. It's no longer about moving people on four wheels or on the train over long distance. It's about com bringing community closer together in places that they can connect meaningfully. So in, the, in terms of park connector, we are now connecting the whole island through all these tiny passages where people can use to move either by walking or cycling. There are 300 kilometers of them. I believe in connectivity and less of mobility because digitalization actually helps us deal with the issue of mobility. But people need to connect with each other because we are human beings. So mobility is about speed and transaction, whereas connectivity is about experience and the outcome of being connected. A well-connected city is a city that stands together during crisis. My final new strategy for green cities is diversity. Diversity is what human race is all about. It's also what nature teaches also us. The reason why a forest survives because of its diversity, its ecosystem of diversity draws strength from different components that supports the well-being of the whole. In the world of sustainability, we started to talk about circularity and whole life cycle of buildings. Uh, this approach still views buildings as economic commodity. But if this economic equation does not work, we just simply demolish them. So to prolong the shelf life of buildings, we should also rethink the historical value of our building. Basically, engineering-wise, buildings can last for hundreds of years. So if we see buildings as part of identity, culture, and history, we're more likely to preserve them. By preserving them, we reduce wastage, reduce demolition. And most of all, it will add to our urban diversity of our cities and increase our citizens' affinity or love for our built environment. Now related to urban diversity is natural diversity. I prefer to call it natural diversity rather than biodiversity. So it is a subset. Biodiversity is a subset of natural diversity. So we have to increase our natural diversity from horizontal planes to vertical planes, from low rise to high rise development. And this will reduce urban heat island effect and improve the health and well-being of occupants. And of course, biodiversity, Singapore is small, but because of our natural con uh, nature conservation program, we are home to some of the large variety of animal and plant species which can be found in the natural habitats. Now, let me conclude. Now, this is one of the longest lectures I've given on this subject. The COVID-19 pandemic has given us a, more than a disease or just a birth of a vaccine has given us time to reflect and rethink how we want to live our lives and whether we should be more self-sustainable. I would also like to challenge our old paradigms and force us to switch to new paradigms. So I'm leaving you with some key thoughts again and questions related to these three um, subjects, self-sustainability. It is time for us to question how self-sustainable are we? Should we be more self-sustainable sustainable in more ways than one? In terms of new paradigms, have you shifted into a new paradigm or are you still holding on to old ones? Are you being left behind? New strategies, do we have new strategies for our work? Are we basing our work on old values such as silo planning, mobility for the sake of mobility and uniformity as an easy way out? Or are we focusing on better outcomes such as integration, connectivity, and diversity of people? Are we making our cities better and more sustainable? So I hope you enjoyed this uh, sharing and take home with you some homework to do and start your research. With that, I thank you for your attention. Okay, so thank you so much. I saved the, uh, thank you for, really, it was really interesting. Uh, is there any questions? Because, uh, okay. I, I would like to ask a question, please. Oh, okay. Hi. Thank you for a very Hello. interesting lecture. Hi. Uh, visiting visiting uh, Singapore a while ago, before all this uh, COVID-19 thing, uh, I spent most of my time underground. All the connecting uh, places between the buildings are 
usually underground and in most of the shopping malls. How do you deal with that at the time of uh, this pandemic? Yeah, we have a lockdown that perhaps uh, quite similar worldwide. Basically, everyone is at home. Um, and even when we reopen, the government takes a very cautious approach by opening little by little rather than a sudden release. So the number of people out on the streets are actually uh, not too overwhelming. Uh, now, of course, we have reached now what we call phase three of reopening today. Uh, in fact, this is the exact day itself. <clears throat> so the streets are actually quite crowded. I was just uh, walking, uh, uh, driving through the mall. The I'm sorry, it, it's the underground streets, not the upper streets, not the uh, upper level, because they are yeah. closed. They are closed. There's no air ventilation. It's uh, usually very. Oh, I I'm see. talking about all the system underground, which is really remarkable, but I think it's very yeah. problematic. Yes, indeed, because they have to be air conditioned if they were to function uh, continuously. Uh, so, this is uh, exactly comes back to my earlier point about Singapore being very heavily reliant on air conditioning. Uh, the underground streets has to be air conditioned and there's no easy way to solve natural lighting as well. Mm -hmm. I don't have a solution, but uh, like I said, um, if we can plan our cities better, mm -hmm. then we can do with less of these uh, air conditioned streets. Thank you. Uh, there is another question here. Um, okay, two more. Uh, sustainability is defined depending on the size of population. What is the max capacity for your Batinium Great Green Mart? The Green Mart Platinum doesn't uh, stipulate a requirement in terms of population size. So it's uh, purely based on firstly energy efficiency. So let's say if you have a large building that house many people, uh, it is still governed by the energy efficiency first and foremost of the building. And then along with it, there are several other smaller criteria in terms of water savings, in terms of greenery in the buildings. So those are the criteria. It's naturally not dependent on population. Okay, and one more question. Uh, what is your opinion on the place project by OMA and Marina Bay Sands? Are these sustainable projects? Okay, the, depending on what you mean by sustainable, uh, from what aspect, if you look at it from green building perspective, um, let me give you firstly the Interlace. Interlace, I think for those of you who are not familiar, is actually a beautiful condominium designed by a world-renowned architect. Uh, it's almost like the, uh, what's, the, what's the wooden block game? Um, it's slipped my mind now. It's like stacking blocks of wood uh, horizontally instead of vertically like a high-rise tower. Um, it is very interesting in the sense that it is visually very uh, exciting. It creates a lot of courtyards and voids where air movement can flow through from building to building. So unlike a, if you if you have been to say, take the mental picture of a Hong Kong high rise building where they are very like vertical sticks that line up like walls, that sort of configuration will not allow air movement to flow through easily. So what, what Interlace has done is actually reverse it and turn it upside down by having the blocks laid horizontally and creating a lot of courtyards. So I think from that aspect, it is a successful green building uh, where it is perhaps not so easily uh, resolved is actually to uh, create those big courtyards. It has to depend on very long structural span. So in terms of resourcing of engineering, uh, it probably uses more, but otherwise it's actually a very beautiful building. Marina Bay Sands, <laughs> everybody who's been to Singapore probably has taken a picture of Marina Bay Sands. It's, it's the building with three towers uh, with a world's longest swimming pool at the height of, uh, I think 50, 60 stories, 60 stories. It's a beautiful landmark that many people see. 
Now, um, depending on what are you looking for in terms of sustainability, it is nothing more than a shopping and, and in fact, a casino complex who is highly dependent on air conditioning. So I don't think that it has done more for a commercial building to be more sustainable. And certainly for the huge swimming pool on top of the roof, uh, you can't call it a green feature because it actually uses a lot of engineering resource. But again, it has become an icon in Singapore. <laughs> Uh, there is one more question here. Uh, what can be done with existing facilities to adapt to the new paradigm? Yes, I like this question. In fact, this is uh, something which I have debated a lot with my colleagues because in, in trying to push for green building that I think it is the same worldwide, we tend to focus on new green buildings uh, because they're easy to do. Right, I'm sure Israel, you have green certification for building, and you're likely to more be more excited to certify a new green building because it's easier to handle. You can do a lot more things with existing uh, or the new green buildings. But bear in mind that every city has more existing buildings that are not green than green buildings, and so long as we don't pay attention to that, that building stock is going to increase. And you are playing a losing game by trying to do catch up to convert the existing building to green. So I actually <clears throat> suggest that governments, for us, we must find ways to incentivize the conversion of existing building into green buildings. If you are a developer who deal with an existing building, your tendency is to want to demolish it first. Now, but why demolish if that building still has a good shelf life of many, many decades to come? So one of the things that we, we think we could do is to first come up with incentives to encourage building owners to improve their energy efficiency by giving them either a, a, a grant to improve their machines, especially the air conditioning to an energy efficient one, or secondly, um, to actually it, it links up with COVID-19 now that I'm going to touch on. There are developers who are looking at their offices and begin to question if the old paradigm of the enclosed office actually uh, could survive another disease X or COVID-19. And they start to want to explore ways to turn the circulation outwards. In other words, instead of an enclosed lift call where everything is enclosed inward to serve the office occupants, can they now start to add on additional outside lifts so that people don't walk through an enclosed space but walk through a natural ventilated uh, lobbies or corridor to go to office? So I think if, if we can start to think creatively to allow building owners to start to convert their existing building, not just to green building, but also one that is pandemic ready. Then I think we have two benefits working uh, for developer to consider to convert the existing building. But this is an excellent question. I really like to have more discussion on this. Please. Well, uh, thank you so much for talking to us. To, uh, um, can, I, can I ask also um, a question? Sure. The last one. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so, first of all, thank you for a fascinating um, lecture. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, since in Israel, um, that kind of project um, in that kind of scale, it's really hard to um, get um, budget um, to to build and succeed um, to to build this kind of things and and especially in this kind of period that we are into right now um, that all of the effort is going to um, to the pandemic and not to um, 
to the to the urban and to the nature um and in israel it's really hard in some certain cities uh for example in haifa which is city that really needs um really good treatment i don't know if you ever visit in israel so um yeah so i just wonder what what is your point of view i mean what what have you have done if you have the possibility like to redesign parts of israel and what 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 would you sell for the municipality um to give them ideas um to do it like with low prices and with low budget and still be able to to make the cities better yeah uh, great question um it, it probably uh not easy without understanding your context but using again singapore as an example as i said in the part on paradigm is that uh, Singapore sought to solve one major problem, which is housing from the very onset. Uh, there are other problems they tried to solve at the same time. Sing Singapore wasn't a rich country at all in 1960s. We are poor. Uh, and so with the, whatever limited resource that Singapore has, it put into three places, as I mentioned. One is um, building some basic infrastructure to attract investors. Second was to build up its ability to defend itself. And the third, uh, there are probably third and fourth pot of money it puts into is actually the housing and education. So I won't touch on education, but housing was a big expenditure for the government. So if I were to design any cities at all from scratch or to repair an existing cities, I would solve its housing problem first and foremost. And this requires a tremendous effort. And I think if you don't solve the housing problem, when the next pandemic comes, it's still gonna be a problem. So it's either you spend the money now or you have to face a consequence later. So this is what I tell every city that I go to, solve your housing problem first. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it is. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you all that you came. Uh, Kylie, a few words in Hebrew, okay? Um, תודה רבה על זה שהגעתם. חלק מהסדרה של הוובינארים עם דוברים מחול, רציתי רק לספר לכם שב-20 לינואר אנחנו מקיימים הרצאה נוספת בנושא של התחדשות עירונית בהמבורג. אני מצרפת לכם פה את הקישור, אם תרצו להיכנס לראות, זה גם הרצאה ללא עלות, ואני אשמח לראות אתכם שם. So everyone, have a great day. Tyler Tian, thank you so much for coming, and you know, we really appreciate your time. People all around the chat tell you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It was really interesting. So just know that. <laughs> and yes, thank you. We will be happy to come to Singapore while, you know, when the time will allow us to do that. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. And thank you all for coming. Have a great day. Bye. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.